Welcome to the Giveology Impact Series podcast, in which we share the experiences and inspirations of social entrepreneurs and change makers around the world. We have Joyce Meng and Vandana Subramanian from the Giveology team here. We're delighted to have Logan Graham and Brody Foy of the Rhodes Artificial Intelligence Lab, also known as RAIL, join us for today. RAIL is an action lab dedicated to using AI to address some of the world's biggest social challenges. RAIL is a team of 25 PhD and master's students who are currently Rhodes Scholars at the University of Oxford. RAIL forms small action teams which work with partners on their specific problems in areas like health, climate change, education, politics, and more. RAIL designs and codes AI solutions to these problems for the partner to implement, as well as generates research papers and scales up the technology of developments. Welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Great. Starting off, what inspired to you to start RAIL? We'd also love to hear your story. You want to take that one, Brody? <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. So, um, yeah, Logan, Logan and I are both currently studying um, PhDs at uh, Oxford. So I'm doing mine in computer science and looking at uh, modeling in health with the lungs and things like that. And Logan uh, is I, doing... Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing machine learning um, and engineering. And so we, we get a lot of exposure to these kind of technologies AI, machine learning, things like that in our day-to-day work, but as is the case with PhDs, uh, it's very, very much all theory and very little application. And so a while back, one night, uh, Logan and I would just be taking this long walk, kind of chatting, and we just went, we feel like we're learning, but we're not we're not getting the hands-on that we crave. So we thought, well, what can we do, do about this? Um, and the idea then just spun, well, there's plenty of organizations with lots of data trying to do really cool and impactful things. And we've got, we're in a network of a bunch of really talented young people who want to build these skill sets. So why can't we connect the two and find interesting projects, impactful projects to work on? Great. That's really, really fantastic. Actually, starting off and taking a step back, if you are a nonprofit or a social organization, how do you know if AI is applicable to your work or if it's not really necessary? Like, what type of requirements does Rail necessarily need to see in order to find a feasible project? Yeah, so um, probably the basic rule is while AI can be a really useful and powerful tool, if you're a nonprofit, the most, most of the time you probably won't need it. And it may be more complex um, than what you need, which is just probably good data science um, and probably pretty simple systems. But the qualities that you need to empower AI to make an impact in your organization, there, there are a few that tend to go together. So one is you have lots and lots of data. Uh, and that data may take it may have lots and lots of variables which may take different types. Um, and uh, if you have, let's say, many, many gigs of um, nonprofit donor data, and your objective is trying to predict which donors are more likely to uh, donate on a recurring um, schedule, um, if there's lots of data there and lots of different types of variables, then machine learning and AI becomes more powerful at picking out patterns than just really simple, um, data analysis uh, uh, does. Um, a, a second reason is where there's a very, very clear and tricky um, predictive problem. So this depends obviously on what area the nonprofit is working on. Um, but if there's something that uh, you want to uh, predict in particular, and you want a system behind the scenes to be able to predict that without having um, a human go in and try to uh, create some reasonable answer themselves, which is, uh, takes a lot of time and maybe error prone, um, then that's where you'd want to employ machine learning and AI. Um, but of course the final answer obviously depends on what the nature of the, um, nonprofit or social impact is. And so we tend to see more, uh, machine learning and AI in particular in places like health, where you have lots and lots of data and very tricky problems where prediction is really, really key. Um, and also where you have data in the form of things like images, 
which very new techniques in um, in machine learning and AI are becoming really powerful at uh, basically analyzing and figuring out patterns in them. So the bottom line is it really depends on your situation, um, but there are a few things that help you know that you, this may be a place where you need machine learning and, and AI techniques. Um, but as a nonprofit, it's worth really thinking about whether or not you do or whether or not you just need to find a data scientist. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's really helpful to understand. And you mentioned health and situations and um, whether it's image analysis or large quantities of data in which AI would make a difference. But I'm just curious, like, when you think about um, situations where this can apply, what does AI enable for these organizations that was not otherwise available using conventional data collection and analysis techniques? And what are some of the implementation of the conclusions that are drawn that, you know, would not otherwise have been there? Yeah, I can I can take that one. Um, so there, I guess there are a, a few things that AI empowers that conventional analysis doesn't. Um, so number one is when the what we call the structure of the data is really complex. So if a human doesn't have an idea about maybe what's hidden underneath the structure of the data, they don't have an idea about what the relationships between the variables would be or where, let's say, across. 10 different variables where the donors and non-donors or the most targeted versus least targeted lie, um, then a human could end up doing a very terrible job at trying to predict that, uh, while a computer can, and generally state-of-the-art machine learning techniques could probably do a fairly reasonable job. Um, and so that, that fits under, that, that's an improvement that fits under the theme of what's called supervised learning, which is where you know what the outcome is, like if a person is going to need a particular social service again, um, and you know that outcome, you can train your algorithms based on seeing that outcome. Um, another advancement is in the area of what's called unsupervised learning, which is where you don't know where the outcome is. Um, you don't know if this person is going to need your service again. You don't have that data if that's the critical thing you're trying to figure out. Um, machine learning algorithms and AI uh, can be far better than humans at um, doing unsupervised learning, which means essentially clustering. So it can spot and do things like visualize or um, help recommend to you that there are certain clusters of, of, um, of data that are hidden that you, the human, have a very hard time spotting. Um, so, for example, if you have 100,000 observations of different individuals um, and 30 different variables, it's going to be very hard to figure out um, natural groupings, you know, whether or not one is high risk, but high wealth or low risk and low wealth or um, high risk certain demographics. Um, and state of the art machine learning systems can do a fairly good job at that, you know, obviously depending on the quality of the data. Uh -huh. um, so it really depends on, on the task, but there's just some fundamental tasks that humans may just be really bad at and may take a really long time that a reasonably somebody like us or others could come in and start working on and within one or two weeks or a day even have a, have a working model. Mm -hmm. I think just, just to add, add a thought to that is that particularly in an area like health, uh, for example, the potential improvement by, from just marginal, marginal advancements in your model are massive. So if you're looking at something based on prediction and you're seeing some massive waves coming through in the healthcare industry with this, uh, getting machine learning and AI based models to predict. Uh, there's, there's a great paper that came out very recently around skin, uh, skin cancer classification. And if you can just even out, outperform a, doc, a doctor, a, the average doctor in classification by mm -hmm. a fraction of a percent or one percent, the potential benefit that that happens because of the size of these systems is really mm -hmm. immense. So sometimes it's, it's about going, we already have ways uh, of doing, of working with these kind of problems or like our standard data analysis or just train professional human intuition. But if we can get just even slightly better, the potential benefits are massive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can definitely see that. But in the process of supervised and supervised learning and clustering, how do you separate out trends and conclusions in the data that are actionable and important going forward versus noise or trends that emerged um, and look statistically significant from like a 
from, a, uh, from an in-sample perspective. Do you want to take that one, Brody? Uh, yeah. So I, I said, I, the, the first thing you, you always, always do with these models is whatever data sets you have, you, you separate by line and you have a testing set or a training set. Uh, so a training set and a testing set. And the idea being that you use, for example, a half, half or a third of your data to build this model. And then before you would say any level of confidence about it, you run it through the other two thirds and see how well it's actually faring in the new data set. Um, and particularly this can then be beneficial if you have data that has been collected, collected under different environments and things like that. So you have to test that. You have to test the transferability. So this is often one of the big barriers with machine learning is it does require a lot of data, both to build the models, but also to have confidence in the conclusions you're seeing. You need extra data to really, really thoroughly test mm -hmm. uh, as you move forward. Great. Mm -hmm. One one potential um, benefit that, or one one system that anybody working with machine learning and AI may want to think about would be um, if, if you first, you'll absolutely need training and, and testing sets and it's essentially figuring out how well your system can generalize. Um, but second, you may want to make sure that you can have a human on the other end looking at what the uh, algorithm or suite of algorithms are doing just to do a double check. And while that may sound intensive, that may take even less human time, the total system combines than having a, a human start um, right at the beginning. Uh, so you may want to have a human on the other side. And in fact, any any sort of machine learning project always has lots and lots of, of, of its people working on gut checks. Does this make sense? Or what types of, what parts of the subpopulation do we need to really care about? And how does our machine learning algorithm predict over them? Mm -hmm. Great. We'd love to learn more about some of the projects that Rail has worked on in the past and the impact that was created. Yeah, Do you totally. Want to so, like yeah, absolutely. Um, so we we started um, in January with four projects with four fantastic partners, um, and in fact, as we as we speak, we're effectively uh, confirming our next round of projects, which we're really excited for. Um, so under these four projects, we had uh, 24 people on the team. So each project had six, five, or seven people on the project. Um, so two projects that I was um, uh, overseeing, one that I was working directly on was partnered with the University of um, Maryland School of Medicine. Um, and we uh, they collected a proprietary data set with lots of very interesting variables on kids with sleep apnea. Um, and one of the big problems there is sleep apnea costs $3,000 to test to see if a kid has it that requires a 12 month overnight stay. And sometimes there's a big waiting period. So it's a, it's a really involved process. And so our challenge was, can we predict whether or not somebody's going to have sleep apnea just based on variables that a nurse could measure in the waiting room, or you could even measure at your home. Um, and one of the outcomes there was we actually managed to, with our algorithms on out of sample testing, we managed to beat um, uh, the best medical benchmarks that we could find in papers in the field. Uh, and uh, which means that we'll be, we'll be writing a, a paper to contribute this knowledge um, and potentially uh, save kids a lot of money and time and help them be, be healthier in the long run. Um, so we're really proud of that one. Uh, Brody, I'll let you talk about a couple as well. Uh, yeah, so another one we worked on uh, was with a uh, tech health tech startup in, uh, based in Kenya called ConnectMed, where their, their startup is around uh, creating a virtual or a telehealth system. So where people can uh, go online and get connected to a doctor uh, via Skype or equivalent service. And what they, uh, what they came to us wanting to know was, was there a way that where they could ask a short series of survey questions to the person when they jump online and build a good predictor for whether to recommend 
like self-care to the person. So just kind of go back to bed, rest up, drink plenty of water and come back in 24 hours and see how you feel or to go connect them to a doctor uh, directly, uh, virtually, or to recommend actually get to a physical hospital because uh, this service is really targeted a lot of rural areas where access to hospital may be quite difficult and you really don't want to go uh, all the way to the physical hospital unless you absolutely have to. Um, and through this system, we managed to build quite a good classifier that could predict with pretty high accuracy whether um, in the same way that a nurse would predict by looking at a patient physically in a waiting room um, to go, do we do we recommend you just rest for 24 hours or do we get you to a doctor now? And so we're hoping as this goes forward that this system will allow the organisation to see a lot more patients and provide this service to a lot more people with a lot higher efficiency. Uh, so that was one as well that was really exciting. Uh, and I'll, I'll just mention briefly uh, one that was a bit more left field for us. Uh, um, and we took on board mostly for the what on earth kind of factor, which <laughs> was a partnership with the uh, Faculty of Classics at the University of Oxford, where we were looking at transcription of ancient Greek tablets, <laughs> um, which was you have this, this wealth of tablets that have been collected over many years from various areas around Greece and the Mediterranean, um, from the Greek Empire. And a lot of tablets, when they've been converted into, like, written down um, from the tablet into a virtual environment, because of wearing away on the stone or chips, things like that, there are missing words and missing pieces. And what we were asked to do was can we build a system that can read through the entire corpus of these ancient Greek tablets and then start working out what the gaps are most likely to be so going when it's reading a sentence going hey this word is missing but I remember reading a sentence a long time ago that looked like that had this other word that that's probably what that gap is which allows you to re uh allows you to get more information about these societies and these civilizations and also massively reduce our uh, burden on this is a task that can typically only be performed by someone who's quite advanced in uh, quite advanced researcher who's been reading these kind of works for decades and so it allows more people to access this information and it's also just an exciting way to bring technology mm -hmm. into probably one of the most technology adverse, adverse fields in the world. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really incredible. Um, you know, thinking about the implications of Rail's work all the way from ancient Greek tablets all the way to sleep apnea. I'm curious, like, what are some of the largest challenges you face as an organization? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I can think of a, a couple right off the bat. So um, one is, uh, I think we actually, and this is a really, really good problem, but we have so many people interested in us with projects that one of the challenges that we face is finding the, making sure that we choose the right project that we feel we can really have an impact in, in uh, eight weeks, because we have to work according to the because we're all studying uh, at Oxford right now, we have to work according to um, the Oxford term schedule when we're all in the, in the same place. So we think about, well, is, you know, this project is absolutely fascinating. Can we do it in, in eight weeks? Um, funnily enough, one of the challenges we don't face is whether or not we think we can do it, because even if nobody knows the particular techniques that we need to um, uh, use on a particular project, everybody's really keen to learn. So that's, that's an amazing, amazing benefit. So that's, that's one challenge that we, that we have. Um, another challenge is, is uh, another very fortunate challenge that really once, now that we've kind of proved that this model works, um, there are lots of other things that we feel we could do to scale up the impact that we're, that we're making. Um, so one of them is turning it into research papers and contributing to the field that takes uh, a lot of extra time to, to make happen. Um, another is actually helping to make the implementation of our projects uh, uh, happen 
um, because when you work on a project for eight weeks, you know it really intimately. Uh, you want to make it easy for your partner to implement the system that you've been working on because it would be a terrible thing to have it go to no use. Um, another is scaling up the technology because you know, we developed solution to one problem uh, which could be applied to problems that a lot of socially impactful organizations have. And so that's a big question of how do we get our technology um, to help those who we didn't work with, but who could potentially use it as well. Um, so those are three big challenges that I face. Brody, if you have any, definitely chime in. The, I, I think the only other one I would add on top of that, um, the, the final challenge that I see is really being at the center of everything is the people. Uh, so I think the reason we can do really, really interesting work is because we have a team of really talented, intelligent people working on these projects. And so I think a challenge that we never try and take for granted is to make sure that the team stay really engaged and so that whenever someone feels like they've reached their time or feels like they've contributed all they can with rail, that we can always find other people to fill those gaps that keep those skill sets at the same level and have that really healthy flow through. Um, and that, that's always, that's really core to how we work as an organization, organization is trying to make sure it's this great environment and this really strong learning experience for all the people who come through. Mm -hmm. Great. What do you see is the future of rail? Like if you think over the next five, 10 years, <laughs> uh, we have gr grand ambitions. Um, I think part, so, so right, at, right at the core of it, part of why we started Rail was we wanted to answer this big question of what, how, how is AI going to um, tackle the biggest challenges in the world? And if they're going to be the biggest challenges that we face as humanity, how can we make solutions to them happen? Um, so I think the, the first aspect of rail is we are going to keep learning um, the models of how this really new and powerful technology um, can be implemented in some of these challenges, which is something that we don't really have uh, answers to as, as society yet, but I'm really excited to find out. Um, so we, we, have, we have other goals uh, as well. So we've, we've shown that um, our projects are can be really, really impactful. And so we keep doing more and more exciting projects and we keep scaling up the impact that we have there. Um, or we turn out, um, we, we turn our work into more and more research that we can contribute to academia more widely. Um, and in the future, we, uh, as some of our projects have shown, there's technology there that we could, we could scale up and help others have access to uh, as well. Um, so in the future, rail looks like, um, you know, a really, let's say a really innovative research lab with a prime focus on doing things in the real world with real world consequences and building technology that, that others can use. Um, mm -hmm. That's the practical aspect. I, Brody, if you have a, <laughs> a, yeah. a, a vision for it, no, go for it. No, I, 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 like, I agree wholeheartedly with it. Um, I, I think the, yeah, one of the big things for me as uh, both of us is really that getting the scale out of what we do to be on just the partner we work with so really going if we work if we find this impact with a certain project going how can we share that how can we bring that out of just the sphere just the channel with that partner um and then just you know less about the organization but more just a general sense of we'd love for um to have taken a bunch of young people through and expose them to some of these technologies, upskill them a lot and then letting them go out into the world and do cool things so that in 10 years time they can think that, oh, they got started on this part, path partly through their time at rail. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, specific to education, uh, which is core to Givology and important to listeners on this podcast, how have AI, how has AI been implemented to be able to improve outcomes here in education and especially in this field where sometimes data can be subjective or difficult to collect? What do you recommend? Ooh, there, there's been quite a lot of um, advances in machine learning in education and I can name drop some of my some of my favorites. 
Um, one big one are well, one one big theme is using machine learning to pick out um, patterns and trends on an individual basis, which is really a, a revolution in, in education that we've never had before. In that we can have systems uh, pick out all the information that a student or a learner generates and figure out what educational path is best for them. So not just what you know, which module of this particular math course are they not as good at, which and they should spend more time on, but which concepts, and that can be hidden in the data. And so you have groups like Khan Academy who are doing really great backend work. Um, uh, and as, as far as I understand, using some machine learning and then other groups like, like Newton, very large and well-funded um, education company, which uh, uses machine learning to create a personalized recommended um, learning path for each individual student. And that I find totally amazing because if you can do it for one with machine learning, you can scale it out to, to millions of people at the same time. Um, so that's, that's the one I'm most excited about, which is, which is personalized, um, personalized learning. And there's lots of opportunities for educational institutions. Um, and in particular, now that we see more data being generated by massively um, open online courses, um, you, there, there's a lot more data in these fields and maybe this data will be, gun to be shared across organizations that the insights from one could be sent to another as well. Um, there's some other practical outcomes in, in education that you really care about, like um, dropout rates. So Microsoft, for example, did some really great work trying to predict high school student dropout using machine learning and ended up doing a, a, an extremely good job of it. Um, so if we can keep more people in the education system by strategizing how we spend our time and then figuring out what they need to learn from a conceptual basis um, on an individual level at the scale of millions. And that's a total revolution in education. Um, the question about whether or not data is reliable or unreliable reliable, um, is a tricky one. Uh, and that, that plagues any machine learning um, uh, problem because if you have a good algorithm, if you, if you could choose a better algorithm or better data, you should probably always choose better data. Um, I, I can only say that I'm really happy that it seems that educational institutions are, um, are collecting more data in more standard and, and rigorous ways, yeah. which allows the power of machine learning to come through. And I, I think to, to really drive that point, um, in terms of data collection and analysis from uh, groups of education, it's and just in any machine learning field, the, real, the, the big things you want in a data set are, are size, consistency, and granularity. So you want as big a data set as you possibly can. And I think this is, if you're looking at education systems, it's definitely easier in countries that have more standardized, nationalized uh, education systems, which allow them to collect a lot of data affecting a lot of students. And then, with that data, making it consistent across all the places you're collecting. So making sure when you're collecting data that you're collecting the same things in different places so that, and you're not missing chunks from one but, and then missing other chunks from the other place and things. And then finally, the granularity is how frequently can you collect data? What are you actually collecting and to what level of detail? And I think this is where online education platforms are amazingly powerful because they can just collect information with such a detailed level of granularity uh, which allows them to potentially make really good insights as Logan said of organizations like Khan Academy and groups that are trying to create personalized learning plans can do so because they're collecting data with this such a fine nature they can look at exactly what you're doing as you learn. Great. Vandana, do you have any questions? All right, then. Um, do you have any advice, message, or thoughts that you want to give to the Givology community or anyone interested in AI as a field as it relates to socially impactful um, fields? And also, if organizations and individuals want to either partner or get involved with RAIL, how can they get more information? Yeah, um, on that second question first, you can you can visit us at roadlab.com, so R-H-O-D-E-S-L-A-B, um, or you can email us at partners at roadlab.com. Um, 
in terms of in terms of advice, uh, one thing that we see and one thing that can help you a lot um, in terms of well, two two pieces of advice. Number one is I think it would be good I as leaders of nonprofits or socially impactful organizations um, to yeah take a think about how this could um, how either machine learning or AI techniques can be applied to what you're doing and don't be afraid of of thinking about how do we deliver what we do in more innovative ways or how do we collect better data to empower us to deliver what we do in in more innovative ways um, that's I also come from a background of personally of running uh, a couple nonprofits and I know how much of your time is taken up with other things um, it's worth just thinking about or finding somebody who can help you think about it because it could change um, some of your um, core delivery uh, uh, models of your operation. Um, the other thing I would say, which really helps get you going faster, and this is key, and if you had 10 minutes, I would absolutely do this. Um, we, I think we see in the community, just in the general machine learning community, that's really exciting to people and people will come and uh, to you, whether it's us as rail or us as PhD students or whatever, and say, oh, I have this exciting problem. Um, obviously, machine learning and AI can solve it. Um, it's be that's a little harder to work with because sometimes they're problems that require 15 years in a full research lab, or sometimes they're problems that we could solve in eight weeks. Uh, and so one thing, if you had 10 minutes of extra time, is try to break down the details of your problem. What specifically are you trying to do? What data do you think you have and that you'll need to do it? Uh, and why can't you do this uh, already? And once you come with those specific details, it becomes a lot clearer what the line of attack is. Uh, and that, that helps you move faster with machine learning and AI. And, and I think just to, just to close that off, what do you think about, when we talk about these technologies, the, the problems that they are absolutely best at, to go back to where we started, is prediction, clustering, and classification. Going, can I look at what's happening now or data around or all these things about a person or a place, things like that, and predict something new? Or can I look at a big data set and see what what pieces are playing together, moving together? What, what things are all clustering together? Or can I... Do I need to be able to classify something? So going, take in some data and go, it's either black or it's white, it's this or that. And so those are the kind of problems. So thinking about framing the problems that you have and going, is there a way I can frame this problem that really fits strongly into one of those three categories? Because if not, chances are it's not right for these type, types of technologies. But if so, and you have data, that's a potential avenue. Great. Thank you so much for your time and insights today, Logan and Brody. It was so wonderful to have you join us on our Givology Impact Series podcast. Thank you.